has come to our family. These are the first words we hear, and they are uttered by the very same person who brought this ruin. He is both our guide and a cautionary tale. The Ancestor is the driving force behind everything in the estate. Darkest Dungeon would not be what it is without him. That being said, he is also the definition of an unreliable narrator. How much is true, and how much he is just telling us what we want to hear, is unknown. So take everything that you're about to witness with a spoonful of salt. We don't know much about his early life, but as far as we can gather, he was born in the manor on the cliffside of his family estate. Once upon a time, their family had their own castle and a standing army, but the years have long since passed and they have sworn fealty to the king. When he was old enough, he inherited the lands, wealth, and title befitting his family status. But to fully understand the tragic extent of his failings, we have to go back. Back to the Crimson Court. The Ancestor would host the most extravagant parties in the courtyard. It was a place of pure decadence away from the eyes of the commoners and the church. It was a place where the nobility of the kingdom could engage in all manner of indecencies, feasting and drinking for days on delicacies from around the world. One Viscount was so well known for his gluttony that he would even consume the food that had rotten after weeks of binging. When they had their fill, they began to engage in more violent and sadistic games, arranged by the Baron. The Baron was a hunchbacked noble who relished in the suffering of others, whipping and beating the unfortunate souls who found themselves at the mercy of the court. While the Ancestor could have stopped these acts, he was more preoccupied with his own vices, and did not want to be labelled as a hypocrite. After some time, the Ancestor grew bored and spiteful of the court, tired of having sycophants and psychopaths come to his home, draining his immense wealth while engaging in their base urges. He needed a way to rid himself of these parasites. During one party, a particularly beautiful young countess caught his eye. But beneath her veil of innocence, he could tell she was a predator, seeking her next kill. He opted to dispose of this problem before it escalated, playing along with her scheme until the perfect opportunity to strike. He armed himself with a dagger as they danced under the moonlight, but the moon exposed her true form, a hideous insectoid that feasted on the blood of humans. Fortunately, or perhaps unfortunately, he managed to defeat this creature. And that was when a sickening idea crossed his mind. He decided to take this opportunity to finally rid himself of his fellow aristocrats. He took the Countess's body and began to drain it of blood, mixing and preserving it in wine bottles to be served at the next gathering. Why he chose this particular route is unknown, but perhaps in his mind, it would be the ultimate form of revenge and humiliation. To label his peers as what they were. They were not nobles or lords. They were less than human. They were cannibals, consuming his wealth and status. 
Or maybe he just hoped the blood would poison them all. At the night of the gathering, he was raising his glass to make a toast, ready to reveal the sickening truth behind the wine the partygoers so eagerly drank, when something horrible happened. His guests began to change, morphing into the same monstrous creature as the Countess, as they began devouring their own flesh. The ancestor dropped his glass, but a single drop landed in his mouth and gifted him with a vision. A horrible and beautiful vision. It showed him the truth. The truth of the world, of life, of the thing that slept underneath the manor. And in that moment, he was reborn. He had glimpsed beyond the void to know what it means to have true power. He walked out of the courtyard, leaving the swamp of hedonism behind, and sought to pursue a new path. He locked the gates of the courtyard, leaving the remains of his fellow aristocrats to rot in the swamp. No longer required to host elaborate parties that deprived him of both time and money, the ancestor was free to pursue his own desires. He had glimpsed beyond the veil. His curiosity was piqued. And so, the excavation began. It started with the planning phase, gathering resources to dig underneath the manor, acquiring tools and bringing in able-bodied men to handle the manual labor. But still, he wished to enjoy himself outside of his newly found interests. In his free time, he chose to walk amongst the commoners in the hamlet. It was a refreshing change from the rigorous rules of court life. He would often raise a glass at the tavern and enjoy the simpler things in life. One precocious waif shadowed him everywhere he went, which he found initially to be charming, then troublesome as his activities became more abnormal. Wanting to delve further into the dark arts, the ancestor had rare and ancient relics of occult nature brought to him along the old road, until it began to draw too much attention. Recognizing the need for war, discretion, he hired a band of mariners who would sail the four corners of the world retrieving artifacts and tomes for him. He had a system of pulleys built along the side of the manor allowing him to take deliveries from the coast, away from the eyes of the townsfolk. While the workers toiled underneath the manor, the ancestor began pursuing the occult arts. Necromancy, blood sacrifices, and summoning were his primary pursuits. Initial attempts in summoning creatures from the beyond all ended in failure, but still, he did not stop. He continued to experiment, making discoveries about which set of circumstances produced the best results, or rather, the least amount of failure. He found pig flesh produced the best results but the mountains of unusable flesh it cost him to make this discovery were beginning to cause problems. The mariners had returned with a large collection of rare tomes on ancient herbal medicine. The ancestor had hoped that by reading these volumes, he would make a breakthrough in his studies. As he was settling in for a long read, he was interrupted by a young woman, making repeat calls to the manor. This young woman boasted an immense knowledge of alchemy. This, along with her beauty, impressed the ancestor, and together 
They began to experiment, planting, harvesting, and brewing all manner of strange and arcane concoctions. The Ancestor incorporated what he had learned from the young woman into his summonings and blood sacrifices, hoping to finally make a breakthrough. His interest was beginning to wane, as each attempt resulted in more failure. With one final attempt, using all he had learned, he had finally managed to summon something from the Outer Sphere, only to find it brutish and stupid. With that final failure, the Ancestor would cease any further experiments. Around this same time, the excavation had broken into an ancient network of aqueducts and tunnels, all that remained of a civilization that existed on the land prior to the Ancestor's family. We know this area as the Warrens. With the excavation of the Warrens, the Ancestor had discovered a solution to one of his problems. He had the wasted flesh of his previous experiments, along with his most recent failure, loaded onto carts and dumped into the Warrens. The landfill of failed experiments would begin forming into the monstrosity known as the flesh. The great thing which we know as the Swine Prince, would also need to be fed large quantities of meat to sustain itself. The Ancestor would occasionally lure someone near the Warrens to be sacrificed as a meal to the beast. While the discovery of the Warrens had solved one problem, it would create several others. People would begin to talk about what they had seen at the manor. The possessed flesh, the unnatural experiments, the excavation. It would spread through the town like wildfire as gossip and rumors, attracting the attention of those outside of the hamlet as well. A ragged man appeared one day in the hamlet, proclaiming to know what the ancestor had done, what he planned to do, and that if he was not stopped, he would bring about the end of the world. Wanting to rid himself of this annoyance, the ancestor bribed the local authorities to have this prophet disposed of. But he proved more resilient than initially expected. He would survive torture, drowning, and even stabbings delivered by the ancestor himself. The prophet would continue to come back and denounce the ancestor to anyone who would listen to him. <laughs> While the Ancestor was dealing with the excavation and an immortal prophet, the young woman who he invited to live with him began self-experimenting, seeking to gain insight into the thing underneath the manor. The fungi changed her, both physically and mentally. When the Ancestor saw her again, he could no longer tolerate it and banished her to live in the wheels, or she would become the hack. Why he sent her away instead of ending her life right then and there isn't clear. Maybe he still had a soft spot for the young woman. Or maybe he feared that he wouldn't escape the conflict unscathed. While he had lost an important source of knowledge, the Hag also taught him something else very important. That there existed others in the world who he could learn from. 
when the Mariners returned with their usual shipment of scrolls and artifacts. The ancestor instructed them to bring experts in the dark arts. The Mariners agreed. For a prize. The halls of the ancestral castle became a citadel of arcane forces, where experts in necromancy from all over the world shared techniques and secrets with each other. The ancestor absorbed these teachings, learning all he could from his guests, until he himself was a master. However, once he gained all he needed from his visitors, he murdered them in their sleep. He did this for two possible reasons. One, the cost to pay these lessons would be better spent on the excavation. And two, the necromancers were loose ends. He had already let the hag free, and with the town becoming more suspicious of his activities, he needed to cover his tracks. A few years pass, and the town was becoming more and more concerned with the ancestor. The ravings of the prophet could only be silenced for a time, and he would return again and again. Tales of the ancestor's dark powers would reach the ears of the common folk, who listened in both awe and fear. Around the same time, a blight had taken the land surrounding the estate making the soil infertile. Perhaps caused by someone who the ancestor banished to the wheels. Left unchecked, she continued to experiment with her fungi and caused more problems. Or in one case, opportunity. With another crop failure, the miller was becoming more disheartened. He had heard the rumors of the ancestors' powers. And so, with nowhere left to turn, he approached the ancestor seeking help. The ancestor was in his observatory, viewing a comet that displayed otherworldly properties. The miller begged for the ancestor's aid. The ancestor agreed to help in exchange for the miller's land. Desperate, the miller agreed, and the ancestor set to work. He prepared stone slabs to be erected around the farmstead. The slabs had several celestial carvings etched into them. While the miller watched his fields intently, praying for improvement, the ancestor looked to the stars, watching for his own harvest. The financial cost of the ancestor's projects were finally beginning to catch up to him. He was burning through his family's immense wealth. In his studies, he had found tales of ancient creatures that dwelt under the waters of the cove. He sought out these creatures, hoping to make a deal to regain his fortunes. Their demands were an obscure idol and a sacrifice to be delivered under the blood moon. The ancestor agreed to the pact, and as he was leaving, he saw a familiar wife before she ran off into the darkness. Unfortunately for her, the idea was already planted in his mind. The night of the sacrifice, the ancestor had lured the waif to the edge of the docks. Before she even had time to react, he chained her to the idol, and with a little push, plunged both into the icy waters. As the tide receded, jewels and treasures began to scatter along the shore. His coffers once again failed. He continued with his schemes, with nary a thought about his victims.
At this point, the ravings of the Prophet had finally taken root. The ancestor's actions could no longer be ignored. The town began to turn against him. Even the local constabulary refuses bribes. Protests were being held, and soon the rioting would begin. Since the constables refused the money, the ancestor instead spent it on mercenaries. But not just any mercenaries. These men were known for keeping quiet and their immoral nature. These men were bandits, killers, brigands, and led by the monster of a man, Brigand Wolf. They brought with them heavy artillery to obliterate anything that stood in their way. The assault on their hamlet was closer to a massacre. The streets the ancestor once walked down ran red with the blood of innocence. Buildings crumbled, and whoever was left alive after the butchering fell into line out of fear. After the skirmish, the brigands would sail per camp in the wheels, enforcing the ancestor's will, so long as he had the gold to pay. The mariner's greed continued to be a thorn in the ancestors' side, as they again increased their terror for keeping the ancestors' activities a secret. But the wealth of the ancestor had finally dried up. Whatever little was left was being spent on the brigands or the excavation. Instead, the ancestor prepared them an alternative form of payment, in the form of alcohol and entertainment. However, this was only a diversion. As the captain and his crew slept off their drunkenness, the ancestor prepared a hex. Using the knowledge he had acquired over his long life, he cursed their anchor, imbuing it with the full weight of his ambition and the contempt he held for their greed. In the dead of night, the anchor shot underwater dragging the ship and the crew with it. If they screamed, the ancestor did not hear it, for the tides of the ocean drowned their doomed cries. Perhaps he just wished to finally put his skills to the test. Or maybe it was something more desperate. But an idea was beginning to form in the Ancestor's mind. The Mariners showed him the harsh truth. His finances were running dry. When, not if, he finally spends his last coin, the brigands would also turn on him. He needed an army of his own, who followed his command with undying loyalty. He returned to the ruins of his ancestral castle, found the corpses of his fellow necromancers. Using all his skills, he was able to resurrect them. With their intelligence intact, such a feat was difficult for even the most experienced necromancer. With his colleagues returned and under his control, he commanded them to begin reviving the dead soldiers who fought on behalf of his family decades ago. And with an army of his own, even if the brigands betray him, he would be able to fight back. After years of digging, countless lives lost, and fates even worse than death, he had finally done it. The dig team had reached the door. The door to the darkest dungeon. They opened the door to another world, a realm of madness and terror that grew stranger with each step they took. 
as they explored the depths of the dungeon. The expedition team found the thing. The thing that had been sleeping for centuries underneath their feet. The very same thing the ancestor saw all those years ago in his vision. A creature of unfathomable power, as old as time itself. The progenitor of life, father and mother, alpha and omega, our creator and our destroyer. They found the heart of the world. Perhaps he wanted to mock his long-standing rival, but he managed to lure the prophet to the dig site. Once there, he opened the door, showed him the heart, and detailed the full extent of his plans. The prophet's mind was broken, both from the sight of the thing and the knowledge of what the ancestor had planned. He tore his own eyes out and ran away screaming that the end was upon us all. Before he could bask in the glory of besting his nemesis, the prophet's ravings unrested the heart, which caused its various protectors to attack. The creatures decimated the expedition as the ancestor fled, screaming and laughing, until he fell unconscious. He was the only one to survive that fateful encounter. And that was when something bizarre happened. Perhaps he underestimated the heart. Maybe his near death changed his perspective. Or maybe it was just a cathartic release one gets after completing a long and seemingly impossible task. The sudden realization of everything he had done to achieve this terrible victory broke him. Alone in his study, he began to write, recounting all the atrocities and crimes he had committed in the name of his obsession. Along with this, he wrote one final letter to his heir, begging them to return to their ancestral home, to defeat the evil that lies within the manor, and to save their family name. As he wrote, you could hear what remained of the townsfolk storming the manor, coming to take his life. But it didn't matter. The letter was already sent, and there was only one thing left to do. He refused to give the angry mob the satisfaction of his execution. So the ancestor placed his pistol against his head and... As one life ended, another's would return. In the swampy remnants of the courtyard, the Countess would reawaken, no longer needing to hide behind her mask of humanity. She began to rule over the court, along with her faithful subjects. They would lure unfortunate souls into the courtyard, to either be a plaything for the Baron, or to be consumed by the Viscount. The courtyard would once again become a hive of unrestrained hedonism. The slabs the ancestor had placed around the farmstead did little to improve the crop growth. Because that was never their intended purpose. They were instead a beacon for the comet that the ancestor was observing. One dark night, the comet crashed into the farmstead, destroying the mill. It glowed with a color unlike any seen on this earth, 
and began to change the inhabitants of the farmstead. The comet wasn't even a comet to begin with. It was another eldritch monster, on par with the one underneath the manor. It displayed the ability to warp the very fabric of space and time. And soon, the entire farmstead would be trapped in a never-ending loop. The poor Miller and his entire family would be enslaved by the sleeper for eternity. The necromancers would continue to raise the dead in the crypts. Without their master to control them, the undead army would lash out at anyone who came into the ruins, protecting the ancestral castle as they had centuries ago. Even though the prophet's mind was broken, his body would not allow him to die. Eventually, he would wander into the castle's chapel, and there he would reside, mumbling gibberish to himself until not even he knew what he spoke of. Over the years, the pigmen would inbreed and multiply until their numbers swelled. They had even developed a primitive culture. With the brigands' culling of the town, the ancestors' supply of meat was severely diminished. Without anyone feeding them, they began to seek out their food. Armed with crude weaponry, they formed hunting packs and would hunt down any explorers who ventured too far into the woods. With no one to pay, the brigands were cheated out of their contract. Either out of revenge, or needing to recuperate their losses, they stayed in the estate, robbing travelers along the old road and ravaging the lands. An elite division is preparing to invade the hamlet again, keeping their cannons ready and awaiting the orders of Brigand Wolf to unleash war. <laughs> In the wilds, the hag formed her own coven of witches. They would continue to spread the corrupted fungus throughout the woods, twisting the very nature of the forest into a reflection of herself, turning lost travelers into amalgamations of the fungi. Or, oh, if they were lucky, she would just consume them in a stew and spare them the torturous existence of being thrall in a service. <laughs> With how dangerous the roads leading to the estate became, the citizens of the hamlet began relying on shipments from sea. Unfortunately, the sea folk, the same creatures who the ancestors once made a deal with, returned to the shores. The pelagic creatures would make the cove their domain, further depriving the town of necessary supplies. They brought with them the waif remade into their own image. She was both their queen and their slave, luring men and women to their doom with her siren song. Under the pale moonlight, sailors would tell stories of a ghost ship in the waters by the cove. A crew forever doomed to drown with their vessel. Tales of a captain barking orders to his crew as they continued to toil on that cursed ship. And if ye weren't careful, they'd chain you up and haul you down with them.
with the door to the darkest dungeon opened, the heart would spread its corruption throughout the land. Cultists from all over the world would flock to the estate, eager to pledge their souls and worship their dark god. However, only a select few were allowed into the manor. The rest still needed to prove their worth, so they scattered throughout the area, attempting to curry favor with the eldritch deity that they might be chosen to ascend. How much time had passed since the letter was sent is unknown. Months? Years? Decades? Until one day, the heir arrived in the estate and set to work on correcting the mistakes of the ancestor. So is that it? Is this the end of the ancestor's story? No. Not yet. I feel like we overlooked something. Something isn't adding up. If the army of the undead was under his control, why not stop the mob coming to take his head? What was his plan to the prophet? Was it just waking up the heart? I think it was something more than that. What if his plan wasn't just to wake the heart, but to either join with it or become an avatar for it? To die is to be reborn, and he was reborn. We see him again, deep in the bowels of the darkest dungeon. He is a part of the heart. Recount all of his experiments with the swine. The reason he used pig flesh was because the closer to human, the more likely the ritual would succeed, binding an entity to a vessel. He could have stopped the mob that was approaching the manor, but he didn't need or want to. His suicide was a part of a ritual, a ritual to bind himself to the heart of darkness. Or maybe he was the heart the whole time, ever since the blood touched his lips. However we choose to believe it, it still leaves us with questions, but the most glaring one is, why send us the letter? It's because the heart isn't back to its full power yet. It requires blood, sacrificed in the name of a righteous cause to regain its strength. The ancestor sent the letter to lure the heir, and as a result, the heroes we recruit. Think about the way he pushes us to keep going and fighting, risking the lives of our heroes to be sacrificed. This could explain why the ghosts are pointing away from the estate. They're telling us to leave, to not play into his hands. Even in death, his shadow still looms. <laughs> Personally, I don't think we will ever fully know or understand the truth. To go down that road is the same one the ancestor did. As I said, he's a cautionary tale. That some things in this world are best left undiscovered. The lengths we go to pursue knowledge change us. Until we don't even recognize ourselves anymore. At some point, we just have to walk away turn our backs on the estate, and leave this hell behind.
but I don't think we can. We answered the letter. We chose to come to this land. And we became a part of this place. Bounded to it, just like the ancestor. How could I leave yet? When there's still so many stories left to tell. <laughs>